Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Julia Swig to discuss Lady Bird Johnson, Hiding in Plain Sight, published by our friends at Random House. Julia Swig is an award-winning author of books on Cuba, Latin America, and American foreign policy. Her book, Inside the Cuban Revolution, won the American Historical Association's 2003 Herbert Feiss Award. She served as senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations for 15 years and concurrently led the Aspen Institute's Congressional Seminar on Latin America for 10 years. She holds a doctorate and a master's degree from John Hopkins University. She's a non-resident senior research fellow at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin, and lives with her family outside of Washington, DC. To moderate today's conversation, we're joined by Tom Healy. Tom is author of three books of poems, including What the Right Hand Knows, which was a finalist for the LA Times Book Prize and the Lambda Literary Award. As curator of public programs at the Bass Museum, Tom has led conversations with writers, artists, and public figures ranging from Questlove to Salman Rushdie, Anna DeVere Smith to Pete Buttigieg, Edwidge Danticat to Billy Porter. Tom has taught and lectured at universities around the world and under President Barack Obama, he led the International Fulbright Scholars Program. He's the chair of the O Miami Poetry Festival and a trustee of PEN America. Throughout this afternoon's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Lady Bird Johnson from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome, Julia. Wonderful to be here with you, Christina. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Christina. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to Books and Books and to Mitchell Kaplan. Uh, Books and Books is just an essential organ of our lives here in Miami. And we're, we're so grateful for everything you do. And everybody who's listening, please support independent bookstores everywhere. And if you don't already have Julia's extraordinary book, please buy it from Books and Books. Julia Swig, good Tom morning Healy. to Hello. you out in California. Good morning, wonderful to see you. And let me say when I first, my first book was published, one of my first events that I did was at Books and Books in Miami because it's a book yes, about- Because Cuba. you have this whole history of our South, um, very close. Cuba and much of Latin America. So I'm, but what we're so going to talk about today is this dramatic pivot you've made into what is a real profound work of, of, of biography and a real genius. And I want to start in that idea of a pivot with an image I can't get out of my head that you write about and talk about of you're in Austin at the library, and there's an exhibit with the sound of Lady Bird's voice that is activated by you moving in and out. And so right. you pivot in and out. And there's something about that image that is so striking to me. The the Lady the Lyndon Johnson Library has a museum exhibit on the first floor. And as you say, I um, walked into the exhibit room, which unfolds chronologically. So there's material that one experiences before the assassination of JFK on November 22nd, 1963. And that is the sound, the audio that I heard walking into a new uh, part of the exhibit space, the motion sensor triggered this voice and it was the voice of Lady Bird Johnson narrating her experience of that tragic day. And it blew my mind and drew me in. And so I listened to it for several times, but in order to get the audio to come back on, I had to leave the room and pivot back in, as you say. What's, what's remarkable to me about that is it's kind of also a metaphor for 
hi, her hiding in plain sight, right, is that her hmm. voice is heard. There were abridged versions of her diary published in 1970, 71, and yet, nothing about what you've uncovered, 123 hours, more than 2 million words. So tell us, tell us, start with us a little before we get into her biography and everything else, what it's like to uncover this kind of material as a scholar and how you set about to begin to think about it as a book. Well, this is the, 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 the compelling theme that of finding unexcavated material about a relatively contemporary part of our history, about a character about the LBJ presidency that has been deeply, deeply studied in mind. So it, the experience of then having so much material to try to bring into a story that we thought we knew and figure out how Lady Bird Johnson's not just her telling of the story of the White House years, but her participation in and shaping in was monumentally um, challenging, but also incredibly exciting because I felt like I was, you know, literally placing somebody into the center who had been there all along, but sort of in this two dimensional, sur you know, secondary tertiary character way. So, you know, that to me is the paradoxical genius of this book, because you describe her as LBJ's real partner in so much of his life and governing and so wise about so much and central, central to the environmental movement, central to early childhood education, extraordinary central to a transformation in race relations. But what's so brilliant is this book is her voice and her and LBJ as overwhelming personalities he's he was and is through so much scholarship about him he's really not there in the same way I mean you you really have masterfully made her full on front and center and I, I I'm not quite sure how you did that but People are peripheral, particularly LBJ and her family. They're relevant and necessary, but they never overwhelm her. Well, that's an interesting phrasing, never overwhelm her, because it goes to the substance of her character. And, and also, I would say that we, I have Lady Bird Johnson to thank, right? She was a journalism and history major in Texas at UT. She had a, a, a in her bones appetite for recording and documenting. And she did this for decades in different ways before she got to the White House. So I think she had a consciousness, right? She writes that she wanted the discipline of keeping a diary. She writes that she knew she was experiencing something unique and needed to record it. But I think she also understood her importance. She had a, a, a level of, of metacognition about her role and her influence, and she wanted to leave the breadcrumbs. And it wasn't that I was forcing Lyndon Johnson off the page, but rather that there was so much material for telling her story that I needed to just tell her story. And, and that meant that the president had a, a huge role, but she to make her the center of a biography, you have to make her the center of a biography. So you you talk about she was a history and a journalism major, and I love you've described she brings her video camera with her on early campaign trips with him when he was in uh, House and the Senate, and she was always had that notebook. But I think I read that you said that a lot of this is not of the writing she did before the White House is not transcribed yet. Is that true? Yes, I mean, I think at the last I checked with the archivist at the LBJ library, her, the, the libraries are organized by pre-presidency, presidency, and post-presidency in the National Archives system. And the pre-presidency material for her in terms of her notebooks that she kept with all of the sort of the, the brick and mortar building blocks of the Johnson political operation that she was so involved in, 
Those right. haven't yet been processed. They're also written in Greg's shorthand. So in terms oh. of priorities in, in resource allocation, you know, it was remarkable at that moment when I went to the library, which we started at the beginning, Tom, uh, the library had just started to put resources behind transcribing the full transcripts of the audio and engineering the, the audio of the tape so that they could be released to the public. And that hadn't been done start until beginning in 2013 or so. So they decided to focus on the presidency because it's the presidency. Her post-presidency material is also not fully processed either. Right. Fascinating. So uh, I'm interested in, so this, there is this just concentrated period, what, 1963 to 69, five and a half years or so. And yes, it is a journalistic project. It's a documentary project, but I couldn't help, and I'm curious if you thought this, but I couldn't help but think of it in an artistic process as well. There is a, a sense of the way she wrote often so beautifully and sometimes so cryptically that there's a, a real lyricism to, and sometimes even when there's lots of long lists, you know, we, we talk in poetry about list poems of things that just have their beauty because things get described. And, and so did you, what did you think about the quality of her writing and, and how, what this project was to her and to you? Well, I thought the quality of the writing was often riveting. And even when it was listing, as you say, I like that too, in, for different reasons, because she has the appetite to record. I love to be inside of her head, watching her choices, what mm -hmm. one chooses to include and exclude. And of course, that's an exercise that every writer has to go through themselves in every single day, what stays, what goes, what details tell a story, what, which are superfluous. And the um, remarkable thing about her as a writer, I say this, is that she ha had the capacity of synthesis. She sat to her, her process was to sit down with an array of envelopes for each day she would be recording that her staff put together these big manila envelopes. There's a photograph of it in the book. And yes, of that would be the ephemera of the day, news clippings, her daily diary, meaning her schedule, Lyndon Johnson's schedules, his daily diary, which themselves are poetry, extraordinary documents, and all kinds of uh, memos and other documentation. And she would s absorb it all in one sitting and sit and record her first draft. And she didn't go rewind and do it again. So right. that's a, a, a capacity mentally and visually and intellectually and verbally that is astonishing. And by the way, you're the first lady of the United States and there's Vietnam and civil rights and an enormously de demanding husband who happens to be the president. And, <laughs> and you're still managing to pull that off. Managing to do this. So I guess, I guess also, I took incredible inspiration from her because I didn't have anything like those pressures while I was working. <laughs> so I, it, it kept my, it kept me disciplined as well to watch what she was able to do. Well, one beautiful thing you you've actually said, there are, interestingly enough, and I'm not going to try to make too much of this, but she came in to the White House at the same age you were when you started this project. Yeah, she had two teenage kids at the same time you did. What what was it like to, because you can't write a book like this without trying to imagine the personality of this person, get under their skin in some ways. What, what was that like to think well, about her? It was, you know, I put all of that together after I was done. Like didn't feel the parallels so explicitly until I had a chance to look back on the those five years. But I, I, I found her quite relatable. And I know that that sounds sort of strange, you know, we're different people, different eras, but also I had taken up swimming and she was a disciplined swimmer and she wrote about the value of swimming to clear her mind. Um, I, I, you know, she was a very close to nature and living in Washington, DC, you can be close to nature, but I developed a, 
huge in indoor plant life surrounding me as I was writing. And um, I think, you know, I could be accused of admiring her too much, I guess, a little bit. But the fact that of the, you know, the ultimate multitasking woman who's um, juggling, you know, she, she was doing that. To, and by the way, talking and giving speeches about re the requirements and the expectation that women, American women do so. The year I was born, she was out there right. making right. such speeches. So I, I found her th to be this disarmingly modern person, even though she was kind of came off in, she was living in a traditional role, in a traditional marriage, in a very conventional public uh, uh, space called the White House. And I was right. you know, three miles away in my bungalow. Different, <laughs> relatable. <Yeah. laughs> Very relatable, right? And she also was just this pivoted a moment of profound national change, civil rights movement, the women's movement, uh, the environmental movement, and the vast social change that happened because of the Vietnam War. I want to stay with this idea of the writing of the book for a minute, though, because there had to be something you, you talk about her almost her extraordinary ability to both be spontaneous, rigorous and synthesize on a dime and not look back like this. This was right. the draft that happened. So I couldn't help but think of one uh, quote that's from the diary that you have this. We had a delicious dinner of too much. So I couldn't help think, well, Julie must have had a delicious dinner of too much when there are all these hours of tape and all how you, you've said too, I think the original draft of the book was 800 pages and it's down to 500 compelling. So what did you do with that too much? And how did you figure out what's in and out? Uh, well, it's nice to have a good editor. I'll say that. <laughs> um, and and actually, just to go back to your list question, the book had more lists in it before my editor got her hands on it. I love oh. the lists because they're so they're they're poetic, as you say, and they're yeah. so descriptive. And also, they're they're a way of cheating as a writer. You know, if you can just reproduce a list or list something, you don't have to internalize right. or annotate. So it was it's the lazy woman's approach to, <laughs> to getting through some material, but. Um, a very difficult question to answer concisely um the material there's a lot of material that is on the cutting room floor of this book that goes to the issues that really captured my interest that for example urban renewal there's a story in this book about urban renewal and it's um the way that lady bird johnson and her contemporaries like jane jacobs who she brought to the white house Yes, we're reacting. Right. We're reacting to the ravages of urban renewal and trying to figure out what do what do people need who live in cities, especially the most underserved communities of color who are the victimized by urban renewal. And and I followed that thread in some pretty deep ways that were a little bit tangential, perhaps, but not entirely because they're part of Lady Bird's story. That kind of material had to go. And I think the the act of one of the things I wanted to do with this book was show the juxtapositions. So show that at the moment that Lady Bird's trying to figure out what does beautification in Washington DC really mean, how to put substance beyond the ornamental, the, the marchers are on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. Right. And so one of the things that, that took some time but that made the question of what stays and what goes a little bit easier was that I developed these mini chronologies of separate events that were taking place at the same time. And then I put them together and allowed my, and that kind of allowed the story to not tell itself, but to reveal itself in terms of what stays and what goes. Well, um, I, I think that was a brilliant choice because it also makes you feel how that had to be to live that way with her, that you right. have, family dramas and personal issues, your daughters, uh, two son-in-laws going off to Vietnam, your husband and all that, the White House, but 
all of the separate issues that she's dealing with, re-election election and re-election campaign, uh, environment, health care, and, and as you say, civil rights, she had to be able to turn on a dime and deal with all these two. And you present that so vividly. I mean, it's both exhilarating to read and just almost superhuman to imagine somebody having her poise and calm through that at a time that clearly her husband did not. The equipoise that she that you revealed to her was clearly had to be essential to him. Oh, it was. And <clears throat> he would have been the first person to, to acknowledge that, as did she. I'm going to just take a sip of water. Excuse me. <clears throat> One of the things, Tom, that also surprised me, and it's not all in the book because there's so much of it, but I tried to put some of it in there, is the openness with which she talked about her own emotional challenges. You know, she wasn't this perfect person, even though compared to his volatility, she certainly seems to have that equipoise in the face of almost any assault. Um, but she dealt with her own ups and downs. How could she not, right? If, if you're managing all of those things and his personality and he required so much of her, at some time she would just have to go to bed and sleep and nap or disappear and hike for 10 days on the ranch without him, just that, yes. by herself. It's very moving to to hear some of the, read some of those passages. One of the things that struck me in, in what you're talking about is long before the language of psychology and self-help and just kind of not the, the age of narcissism, yeah. she had such acute, wise language for understanding psychology, depression, moods, the relationship of the body to the mind, things that are almost startling when when you think this is a public person writing for history and such, but that psychological insight to, of so many passages was really just, was I was godsmapped some of the time. <clears throat> As was I, and that's another aspect of why I think I found her so relatable, so modern, so contemporary. I don't, you know, we've talked in, in the course of discussing this book with other people about where she got that capacity, where it came from. And, and at the end of the day, I think it's so many things, but she had a, a, an early childhood where she lost her mother when she was five years old. Five, right. She had, uh, she was raised by descendants of enslaved people as well as by her Juilliard trained pianist aunt and her kind of out of Tennessee Williams uh, father. And she was very, very autonomous and independent starting when she was 13 years old and got a car. And, and you know, she had this, just this deep, deep, deep inner reserve. And it's yes. something that Lyndon Johnson spotted in her early on, uh, right? LBJ right. proposes to her the day they meet. And, and right? he, he was and it's also- a shotgun wedding practically. Right? Exactly. And, <laughs> practically, and he was also such an astute judge of character. He yes. could size somebody up and he, he was drawn to low ego people. And he found that brilliance and that inner reserve and uh, that low ego individual in, in Lady Bird Johnson, it's, it is astonishing who, who she was, yeah. but also Tom, that, that we'll come back to this, I'm sure, that it, it sort of has gone unnoticed. And part of right. that was her public persona that she shaped. She did that with some degree of thought, I think. Right, that she com worked desperately to, to complete him and make him survive through, through this period. So I want to stay with the framing of this book because mm -hmm. another thing that you do, which is, again, extraordinary to me in, in such a big book with so many strands happening, but you begin 
have in the middle and end with moments of real extraordinary drama. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you know, so let's just talk about the for that very beginning where, you know, it's the end of uh, the Kennedy's life. He's just been shot and, and that she starts, what, eight days later, is it the diary and this riveting clarity and specificity that are astonishing to me. So you pull us right in with imagining what that's like to live in that moment of trauma, but you live on, you've got work to do. You've got a, your, pre, your husband's become the president, you know, and, and this, this is just, you're entering as first lady in the shadow of Camelot and all this. And so you open, you, you really grab us by the lapel and pull us in with that. She recorded that eight, that experience of November 22nd, 1963, as you say, eight days after the assassination, when she was in the middle of orchestrating this very finely tuned but difficult and totally public transition for with Jackie. Jackie had to leave the White House. Lady Bird is going to move in. And yet she starts sitting down and recording in the middle of all of this. And the trauma, you know, she has traumas throughout her life that shape her life. Her father dies during the 1956 presidential campaign. She's very sick. Lyndon's not campaigning, but they're very involved in politics. This political assassination in 1963, followed by two more of Martin Luther King Jr. and then Bobby Kennedy. <clears throat> So her, her ability to, to depict and simultaneously live through these huge national tragedies is, is pretty significant. And I think that I was luck, I hate to say this, it allowed me to shape the book, as you say, starting with one assassination and ending more or less with another, which is the Robert F. Kennedy assassination and the aftermath of the, the 1968 conventions in, in, in Miami and in Chicago, which is- And there's an astonishing scene that you write about with all her history with Jackie and so many very moving things and <clears throat> her astute understanding and their complicated relations, but an astonishing scene in St. Patrick's Cathedral. Could you share that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll just skip back and just say that the Jackie Lady Bird relationship kicks off in the 1950s when Lady Bird is Jackie's senior by a couple of decades, but also by seniority. L Lyndon's the, the majority leader in the Senate and Jack is, has also come from the House and Lyndon, as Lyndon did into the Senate and Jackie's not so into the Kabuki theater of politic politics and political spouses in Washington D.C., but she plays along, and Lady Bird brings her along. But the and at that point, Lady Bird really knows Washington inside now. Inside and out. I mean, she's the intelligence gatherer par excellence, and she's the senior spouse in the Senate, and she's been there for twenty years, so she's a right. total political animal, and. Jackie's a equestrian and a debutante and has studied in Paris and isn't, you know, at all of that ilk. But the 1960 campaign is a time when Lady Bird, although now subordinate to Jackie in terms of the Johnsons being at the vice presidential level on the ticket and the Kennedys leapfrogging up to the top, Lady Bird campaigns as Jackie's surrogate all over the country with Jackie's sisters, sister-in-law, her mother-in-law. I was so surprised to read all that. All over she went. All over, I, I, I don't, my mind doesn't retain numbers, but if I said it was 100,000 miles that she traveled over the course of 1960, that could be the number, it's, it's in the book. Right. Um, all over the place. And, and, you know, she was credited for winning Texas for the Kennedys yes. as part of that. So even RFK could, uh, said that, right? Who, right. Who, who didn't want to give the Johnson's credit for anything if, precisely, if Bobby couldn't. Anything. I think yeah. he appreciated Lady Bird 
significantly more than he did LBJ, to put it mildly. Yes, it seems so. Yeah. So the six. So let me just stop for a yeah, quick sec. Sorry, sorry Dave. Uh, to tell our audience that please, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Julia, there's a que ask a question section. I've typed them in, and, and at the end of our talk, we'll we'll bring those questions in. So we'd love love to hear from you soon as well. So thank you. But yes. No, so so when Lady Bird was second lady, she continued this role as serving as Jackie's surrogate, often performing ceremonial duties that Jackie didn't want to. And so by the time of the assassination, although there was a lot of talk that perhaps the Ken Jack was going to bump LBJ from the ticket and bring on right. somebody else, the Johnsons and Jackie were very close. And there's all kinds of letters showing that, of this kind of intimacy that you have from being in that Washington bubble together at such a high level. Um, when the assassination happens, the two of them, Jackie and Lady Bird, orchestrate this really sort of exquisite transition. And it's very difficult, as I said, and very much in public. But once Jackie leaves the White House and leaves Washington, D.C., the ice starts to set in and Lady mm -hmm. Bird has no trouble recasting the role. I wouldn't say no trouble, but because they're so different, she doesn't have any illusions that she can fill Jackie's shoes. Right. So she has the ability to build her own public persona, find her own platform and turn the platform into something much different than it was and much more significant, I think, than it was under Jackie. But Late, to jump to St. Patrick's, I kind of don't want to give away the story, but the yeah, don't. But the St. Patrick's Cathedral moment at ja at Bobby Kennedy's funeral is one where Lady Bird's capacity to narrate and bring drama and emotion to such a profoundly difficult moment is again just mind blowing. God's it's astonishing. Day. It's astonishing. So, but. There's also the very end of the book that I believe your capacity to set these things up is so brilliant too. And it's really the epilogue where, mm -hmm. I mean, this scene is just beyond, for a writer and here we are talking for a bookstore and it's a, so you imagine, so you are Terry Tempest Williams and you have written <laughs> this environmental book and two people show up in the audience. That's kind of embarrassing. But one of them is Lady <laughs> Johnson. So tell us, oh, tell us that about that. So much. Um, well, as you know, Terry Temple, Tempest Williams is a beautiful nature writer and environmental uh, activist in her own right. And she published a book um, about the national parks. And she went to national park after national park and described them. And that was more recently. Sorry. She was promoting another book, I can't remember which, and she was invited to a spa outside of Austin, Texas. And this is sort of, I believe, early 1990s, maybe a little bit later, because the deal with the spa was, and I would like to be invited, if you're listening, to in Austin, Texas, to come to your spa. And instead of a fee you get to spend a couple days at the spa so one of her requirements well you can was, come to the the books and books spa and okay i'd be happy to do that <laughs> so so at the spa she shows up for her reading and there are two people there only and they're sitting in their in their spa robes and they're both in wheelchairs wow. and she does her reading from her book and then one of the ladies raises her hand and it's Lady Bird Johnson. And they engage in a discussion about how to communicate to the public yeah. about the environment in a way that the public can feel connected to the story that you're telling. That if you want to get people to, if you want to mobilize people to protect the environment, they have to be able to relate to the words. I, I wrote it them. down. I loved it so oh, much. Can I you, just read yes, it? Please, so please, please. she says, and you describe her. She's very elderly now, she's right. in a row, and she's near blind. Correct. And at the end of this long life of advocating for the environment and many other causes, you know, being a southerner and 
having her own family kind of disown her, her advocacy for civil rights. She understood deeply the power of language. You've just given us a whole book with this. And she says, beautiful language isn't enough. You have to be very smart about what you're doing when you're talking about the environment. You have to pe reach people where they are, not where you are. Yeah. And I, I mean, you have, first of all, you've just achieved that in your own book at this point. And it's just balanced too with the way the book opens at the assassination, something that is on the mind of everybody at the time. And she knows it's her words about it are not, getting revealed in the next day's newspaper. So they've been there were years off. There's something that's just so poignant about how you framed that, something so beautiful. I was so excited when I found that anecdote and that, <laughs> and I knew, and, and it's my sister who's a big hiker and a, follows Terry's work. And she said, Julia, you've got to look at this. And it was wow. a year into writing the book. So very early days, but I knew that I would end the book with that because it said so much about, well, it's such a gorgeous scene, but it also says so much yes. about Lady Bird's political consciousness and helped me to understand <clears throat> how it was that a person that had such a profound environmental vision could have, although she chafed against it, could have um, packaged that in what she called and what was called beautification but she was aware this shows you how aware she was of where the country was in 1964 around environmental consciousness which was very yes. early days right you, there's a parallel moment that's near the end of the diary i think christmas time in 68 just before they're leaving and you know claudia Alta Taylor Johnson writes, I wish I had been Claudia all my life. It gets to this too with beautification and other things, the issue of language and naming things. And yes. so talk about that, Claudia Lady Bird. Right. The um, you know, she undertakes an environmental agenda which is called beautification beginning in 1964 although it really picks up in 65 and she hates that word from the very beginning she talks right. about it as supercilious and as a euphemism that is very hard to to get past but she herself with her kind of a informal big tent coalition of environmentalists and philanthropists does start by beautifying, focusing on the ornamental, and it moves to a much more uh, direct look at environmental justice and civil rights and the Great Society and how they're connected and how she tries to connect them. But at that moment, later on in 1968, when she comes out and says, I wish I had been Claudia all my life, it comes in the aftermath of a very important speech that she gives. She follows Whitney Young, who at the time was the president of the Urban League, accused right. of being sort of too close to the white establishment. But in July of 68, the two of them are giving a speech for the American Institute of Architects speeches in Portland, Oregon. And Whitney Young just says in no uncertain terms, you know, right. this is a this is a racist guild. You guys are part of the problem. You've you've drawn a noose around American cities. And um, because what had happened is that the Architecture Guild had basically run to the federal monies to build these horrible towering housing projects where yeah. actual neighborhoods had once been. And it had been part of the urban crisis and part of what people were protesting about in American cities. And it was they all were, white architects, white male architects doing it. Totally. I mean, and so it and so it was a, a, a direct assault at them and and it's in the book. Lady Bird. Yeah, it's electrifying the way you describe it. I mean, I feel like you're in that hall with that speech. Completely, completely electrifying. And and the words too are so resonant and relevant to today. Today. That's the thing that are. that is another aspect of writing this book was during the racial reckoning of this country and looking at what Americans of color 
but now more than that, are protesting against, against police brutality, against the lack of housing, against redlining, against, you know, uh, prohibitive mortgage or non-existent mortgage financing, all of the elements of the 1960s that were bringing people into the streets here today. In any case, Lady Bird follows Whitney Young and she gives a speech which in which she says, I think you know what lies beneath that rather inadequate word of beautification. And she goes on herself to describe a much more comprehensive vision for bringing access to nature for Americans living in American cities. And, and she is given a standing ovation. It's an excellent speech. It's the speech where she could finally comes out as the environmentalist that she is, although she's started to do it in the last few months. And after the applause, the Secretary of Agriculture gives her an azalea called Mrs. LBJ. Right. And you know, she records this moment with this kind of throw up her hands, eye roll sigh, which is like, no matter how hard I try to make my voice heard about my environmental agenda, I'm still pigeonholed. And the pigeonholing of the word ladybird, right? It's so feminized, it's so accessible. It, 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 it suggests somebody who doesn't have the gravitas of a woman whose name is Claudia. And I right. think I wish I had been Claudia all my life is a statement about her awareness of the gap between the gravitas inside and the pigeonholing of the name. Right. Let's stay with architecture for a minute because one thing I had forgotten that Gordon Bunshaft, who did the Hirshhorn Museum, which is uh, the role that Lady Bird plays in, in getting the Hirshhorns to give the collection and, and, and the groundbreaking, unfortunately, only happens as they're about to, to leave. But Gordon Bunshaft designed that beautiful concrete round building. And I'd forgotten he also built the building uh, for the LBJ Library. So I was looking at that a little bit and he too she was so central to that but if you read some of the things he said he was very dismissive of her he was very dismissive you know i went back and was reading some of his oral histories the other day and he was quite dismissive of her she what a braggart she she said and i i can't remember if it's in the book or if it fell onto the cutting room floor right that she thought that Bunshaft was behaving as if he owned the project, meaning of the LBJ library, rather than right. he was, you know, but it was Lyndon who liked Bunshaft's design, not Lady Bird. And I right. think he must have understood at some level that she wasn't so wild about him. She described the library as a face without eyes. And it is wow. just, if you if if you take a look at it, it is just this kind of mausoleum looking huge yes. concrete uh, facade of nothingness. It is a face without eyes. And she didn't want to build something that looked like a mausoleum. She didn't want to have something that was kind of felt dead. And she worked really hard to in her post presidency to make it a living breathing institution but the but, but the Hirshhorn story if we can talk about it for just a second i don't know if we have Please time Please do i mean it's a beautiful story That was a story that um i was also very surprised to find out about the uh there was a big competition in the beginning in the early 60s to get the Hirshhorn collection and the Tate wanted it and a museum in Rome and Tel Aviv it was a global competition and Hirshhorn's um, was uh, cultivated by an arts philanthropist named Roger Stevens, who was head of what was the precursor to the National Endowment of Arts. Right. And was very connected to the Kennedys and then stuck with the Johnsons and worked with Dylan Ripley, the, the, who became secretary of the Smithsonian Institution in early 64, to get the Hirshhorn collection for the, the American people and to, to place it on the National Mall. And they realized early on, and part of this was Lady Bird's proclivities, and part of her part of it was her desire to show that despite the corn pone Texan Southern uncultivated reputation, that the Johnsons actually cared about the arts. And so she yes. she she took a deep dive into learning about Hirshhorn's collection and participated actively 
in getting the collection. And I think she ultimately was responsible for Joe and Olga Hirshhorn deciding to donate to the Smithsonian. She even wound up, and there's some wonderful scenes where she describes her trip to Greenwich, Connecticut to see his artwork. And she describes it's it's similar in vain to the, the, the descriptive power of the assassination uh, entry, where she's talking about the Henry Moores in exquisite detail about the Jacqueline. Well, and just even how she, I'll never forget her wa walking in and there the Rodin's Burgers of Calais, which right. is, you know, a gut wrenching uh, group of sculptures. And she has the power of that immediately. You just sense her, yeah. she has a deep understanding of pain and compassion. I mean, it makes clear why the arts mattered so much to her. They, um, and, and, and she was also able to describe something so beautifully, even while saying that she didn't necessarily like it. I'm not talking about the right. burgers of Calais, but she wasn't, she wasn't, you know, a fan of abstract expressionism necessarily, but she could see a work and describe what was there and see that it would be powerful to right. somebody else. There's so a description you have of her talking about uh, trying to get a Mary Cassatt painting yeah. and the choices they have and the one that she settled on. And you can just picture the painting just in her words of describing it. Hey, so I want to remind people again, please ask some questions if you'd like. We're going to get to that. Um, Julia, one of the things we haven't talked about is in addition to this book, you made an extraordinary eight part podcast for this. How did how did that come about? Was it while you were writing after that? How, how did the, that, and this probably I assume it's a hugely successful podcast, uh, but did you do the two media at once, writing a book? And being, so how did that I I made happen? that superhuman. I couldn't have done that. <laughs> you know, I have a friend who, um, when I was finishing my first book, actually said that he found that it was always wonderful to have an another project to dive into immediately because there's this lag time between oh. finishing one book and starting another where you can get kind of lost and you know dis disconnected from the the routine of of the previous book. But with the so with the Ladybird podcast, which I did with a wonderful production partner in in my friend Adam Pincus, who has something called Best Case Studios. Um, we did that with ABC News. ABC News has a, a, a podcast platform that they're developing or material. And so, but the, to answer your question, because of all the audio that right. we have in Lady Bird and because her voice is just so dynamic and enticing and unique, I just knew as I was writing the book, that this had to become some kind of audio project. So mm -hmm. once the book was not impressed, but once it was largely out of my hands, we started developing the, uh, the podcast and the pandemic hit. And although we had produced the deck and the sizzle tape in February of 2020, by the time we actually had a partner in ABC News, I set up a, a studio in my son's, who's in college, bedroom. And oh. so produced the podcast remotely between the producers in New York and Connecticut and pretty much everywhere. Right, because it's first. COVID time, right? Right, it was COVID time, but there was some technology that makes it pretty easy for the my uh, collaborators to see me while I'm recording. And we wrote, we basically took the story and figured out how to tell it using the best audio and followed largely the arc of the book. But it's not just Lady Bird's audio, Tom. It's also all this contemporaneous archival material that we were able to draw yes. from. Yes, really extraordinary things. And it is not at all a substitute for the book. It was, I didn't come to it until after I'd read the book, but it is, it is a surround in a way for, for the book. So I really encourage people to to read the book and listen to the podcast. And speaking of listening, the audio book is damn good for for this too. So, but you chose, despite your beautiful voice, not to narrate. 
Oh, well, you you have really taken a deep dive. If you've d listened to at least some of the audio, you're my friend. How can I not? <laughs> and the book. I mean, the Lady Bird Johnson it, total immersion. I'm so grateful, Tom, for you to do that. I um, wasn't given the option by Random House of reading it myself, and I'm really delighted that they had the smarts to hire such a brilliant voice actress. I mean, she uh, is a Kirsten Potter. Really good astonishingly wonderful and she really i was i was really blown away when i heard not just her she doesn't impersonate so when she does dialogue between lyndon and ladybird for example there are two different voices but she's not doing an impersonation right. um but she captures the narrative voice my narrative voice too i thought i i agree no it was, it's yeah. terrific so so some questions here in you're reading of all the diaries. Did you find any mention of the 1968 visit of the King and Queen of Nepal hosted by the Johnsons? Oh, wow. I'm, I'm wondering who's answering, who's asking that question. Some I, I, yeah, I don't. Probably had knows about it. It does. Uh, oh, it's Peter Burley, Ambassador Peter Burley. Oh, well, um, I, I should say that if I. I'm speaking on my iPad. If I had another screen open, I would rapidly look to look at the specific date and see if there was an entry about it. But I can't. I can't recall at the moment, Ambassador. <laughs> I, I, I don't another. Know, but so here's another question, uh, and I was interested in this too. Hubert Humphrey barely makes is is mentioned by her. Now the, I can understand the relationship with her husband. So he was, but. In the book, you know, there of course when when Lyndon decides not to run and stuff, he's there. But it's not in in how you read it. She didn't did he never really come up? No, that's a that I mean it's it's a it's a sad take, but maybe an honest one on the role of Hubert Humphrey in the the Johnson right. presidency. But I would say also, you know she had an important relationship with Muriel Humphrey right. and really, really admired her a lot and sometimes campaigned with her. But that was one of the cases in which I had to make a decision about sometimes okay. excising. Sure. Right. That would have been a whole chapter or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so nothing personal on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a question about uh, the arts and the central role it played following it being so central to to the Kennedys and how mm -hmm. uh, Lady Bird fashioned her own path. Um, the arts for Lady Bird were a, a kind of such, such, since they were such an iconic space that the Kennedys had occupied. Whoops. Hi, sorry, I lost Hi. you for a minute. I, I yeah. apologize. Um, she had, as did Lyndon, a really deep belief that government has a role in supporting artists and in making art accessible to the American people. And so it, it turns out, we looked at this, that Lyndon Johnson is the American president that was able to mobilize the most federal dollars into the arts of any president since. Right. We'll see if that changes with, with this federal uh, we'll funds see. movement, right? right? So it's, it's not just who they brought to the White House or the art that was hung on the walls there. I think their significance is really in mobilizing money to support tiny theaters and tiny dance companies in small towns around the country in putting money into what became the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, in funding what became the public broadcasting system. Right. In really, yes, and in really kind of understanding in their bones that human nature requires not just access to natural beauty, but aesthetic creation and not just access to, but participation in that creation. The acquisition of the Hirshhorn is a kind of high level expression of that. Right. The other 
there's another episode in the book, and I know we don't have time to talk about it. 1965, the White House Arts Festival, yes, which is this incredible story, totally overshadowed by the Vietnam War, when they kind of in their <clears throat> big Texas scaled vision bring a couple of hundred artists and their works to Washington, music, dance, photography, very, very contemporary, Jasper Johns, Mark Roth, Rothko, Richard yeah. Dubinkorn, all of it to Washington DC. So to answer that, to, the, the, to say this, I think, I think they have a kind of populist approach to art that brought it from, from the, the elegance and preciousness that the Kennedys approached it with to a much more mass-based accessible approach to, to art. Yeah. I mean, one, one scene where you describe this very beautifully is when they have uh, the German premiere to, to Texas and Van Cliburn doing, <laughs> uh, you know, Heart of Texas and you know, this whole mix of high and low that it sounds right. like it got exactly right. Even the Eastern press praised them for it soon after Camelot's gone. And it, it's very clear the snobbery of the Northern and Eastern press toward Texas. And then of course, being the site of JFK's assassination. So they 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 had to contend with a lot of prejudice. I know all of this time, you know, the elements of their uh arts promotion of environmentalism, the aspects of what they did domestically are totally overshadowed by Vietnam. Yes. And and I wonder, I don't know if we have time, I was gonna take a crack at just speaking a little bit about Vietnam or, or reading a passage. Do we have time for yes. that? Yes, yes, of course, let's do that. I um, say we do, I okay. haven't been told no. <laughs> well, um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, the the looking at the Johnson presidency retroactively there are two components to it, civil rights and Vietnam. But Vietnam right. has, and and rightly so, become most of the story, although I hope that I can help to flesh out everything else that was happening in that kind of the simultaneity concept of the book. Lady Bird shares Lyndon's blinders uh, on Vietnam. And she has an evolution about the war. But at the beginning, as in 1964, before civil rights is passed, before the war on poverty legislation is passed, before the Great Society is announced, the Johnsons are very aware that the war might derail their domestic ambitions. And they're so aware of it that Lyndon at one point, early in 64, even thinks about whether he's even gonna run again. Right. But anyway, everybody knows the story. He does run again and the war destroys lives in Vietnam and American lives, and it, it creates so many other tragic consequences. But in 1964, at the time of just a month after the Civil Rights Act has passed, the Johnson administration is very, very popular. And the country is still celebrating the Civil Rights Act passage. They host U Thant, who's the Secretary General of the United Nations, at a yes. big state dinner in Washington, D.C. And it's filled with all of the who's who of politics and media and culture. But it's also at the very moment that the United States is beginning what's going to become a major milestone in the escalation, which is the Gulf of Tonkin attack yes. against North Vietnamese boats. So I, I say that as way of setup to these two paragraphs that I'm gonna read, because it kind of gives you a sense of Lady Bird's awareness of the war coming, but also her, her um, this is very early days around the war. Yeah. It fell to the first lady to introduce the evening's entertainment. The cultural tides had yet to shift against the White House, but the choice of one of the country's leading folk groups to serenade the war and peacemakers could not have been more laden with significance. Civil rights activists already, and still unabashedly enthusiastic about Lyndon Johnson's legislative muscle on that front, Peter, Paul, and Mary performed for the 142 guests. 
the group, whose music later became synonymous with anti-Vietnam protest songs, had a history of ties to the Democratic Party. They'd performed at a fundraiser for JFK at the DC Armory in 1960 and become friendly with the Johnsons after accepting an invitation to the after party hosted at their home, the Johnsons home that is. Despite the intense focus on Vietnam among their audience that summer evening, Peter, Paul and Mary did not intend for their playlist to make a political point about the war. We were not troubled by the surrounding events of the Gulf of Tonkin, Peter told me when I interviewed him. Vietnam had yet to penetrate our consciousness as the debacle it was about to become, Peter Yarrow explained. The group performed Puff the Magic Dragon before the song became a popular reference for both marijuana and napalm. But of all the songs the trio performed that night, it was their cover of Bob Dylan's chart-topping Blown in the Wind that most resonated with Lady Bird. The song was first released a week before the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom of the previous year, and the trio sang it on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial as a civil rights protest song. A year later, just a month after the Civil Rights Act passed, singing the song at the White House for them marked a celebration of progress by Lyndon Johnson, not protest against him. But for the audience and for Lady Bird, the trio had conveyed an entirely different message that evening. The next day, the First Lady recorded into her diary a quote from a press report that every one of the 142 guests sensed the winds of danger now blowing around the world from crisis-torn Vietnam. It was, Bird recorded with unease in her voice, a very haunting song, perhaps an omen, she felt, of what was yet to come. The next day, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing President Johnson to use military force in Southeast Asia. Staggering. I, I, when I read that, I was just stunned to understand that shift of consciousness, even from, you know, Peter Paul Mary, that right. it, there was that time. The other thing I couldn't help but think, and they make a couple other appearances in the book, you bring some wonderful through lines of many characters, but this idea of that song that she loved too, the answer is blowing in the wind, seemed to me almost a metaphor of finding her voice diaries and bringing them onto the page and bringing them up to us. That that voice of hers was always there, but blown in the wind instead of uh, being concentrated into the powerful partner and extraordinary person that she was. So. Our time is up, Julia. I have so many more things I'd love to ask you, but there are many other interviews you'll be doing, and, and it's just been so wonderful to talk to you, my friend. Congratulations. Thank the book you. is really Thank brilliant. Such an what? honor to have you, Tom, to talk with about the book. Thank you very much, and thank you to Books and Books for having us. What a great, great conversation. Congratulations. That is just, oh my God, I learned so much, took so many notes. Uh, thank you to everyone joining us from everywhere. A reminder that if you haven't already purchased your copy, you can do so on the green bar below on the screen and we'll ship it right out to you. Or if you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores and pick up a copy, you're welcome to do that too. Um, I can't wait to see all of you. You're both invited to the Books and Books Spa for sure. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> so let's do that. Let's do that soon. And thank you so much for joining us here in our thank virtual you, bookshop. Thank you, Julia. Bye. Thank, bye, -bye. thank you.